All right. We are live. The intro is just long enough. Just long enough. There are times where I want this intro to be like 10 minutes, but that might be a little bit too long. <clears throat> All right. So, we have a solar eclipse coming down the pipes. April 8th. We're going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about it. So if you have questions, this is why we're here. We're going to be talking about this stuff because sometimes <clears throat> people don't like to talk about this stuff in a church setting. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I don't blame them because there's not always a lot of time on a Sunday morning to unpack stuff like this. There just isn't. You have worship, a worship service, and then you have the message, you have announcements, all kinds of stuff. And probably the message would be anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. And it's kind of, it's one-sided because you basically listen, whereas here we can interact. And this is what's kind of nice. And then obviously when you go to church, uh, you can fellowship with other believers and all this kind of stuff. But this is where we actually wrestle through some of the, the difficulties, if you will. Talk about the rapture. We talk about the timing of it, the season for it, and how everything seems to be lining up. And it's just interesting when you look at the solar eclipse happening on April 8th, and we've we've done a few videos on that already, and I plan to do a few more. There's something going on. <clears throat> it almost feels like there's something they're not telling you. And when I say they... I'm talking about the higher ups and I'm not going to make this into a conspiracy video and all this kind of stuff. Cause I can go down that rabbit hole with the best of them, <clears throat> but a little bit parts. I should have grabbed some water said I got some coffee for tonight and it's uh 10 30. Instead we're forced to wrestle through this stuff. Kind of on our own, when you think about it. Kind of on our own. And yeah, I'm going to go through some of the comments. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> Let me see here. We have Bothell, Washington, in the house. Bothell, Washington. I've never been there. I pray thee, somebody that reads the King James Bible. How long is this intro? <laughs> That's awesome. Not sure. Thumbs up. Anna's here. Taylor made. Great name. Thandrill. And then Mary Smith. Welcome again. She's always on here. This is awesome. Hope nothing happens. Yeah, and there's um, there's a case for that, you know, like it could be nothing. It could be just, hey, wake up a little bit. It's nice to be able to stargaze and look at the solar eclipse and all this. In Canada, we won't see it. I believe if you're in Georgia and if you're in all the Nineveh towns, I guess there's like a pandemic of towns called Nineveh. And the solar eclipse is going to hit seven of them. Still baffles me. And I get it. People say like the United States is founded on, on Christian principles and all that stuff. But Nineveh is from the Old Testament. Jericho, Babylon, all this kind of stuff. It's probably not a name I would call my city is Babylon. 
Jericho would probably be another name. Probably wouldn't use right out of the gate. <clears throat> Gath. I'm surprised the United States doesn't have any cities called Gath. All right. Let's see here. Shane and Aaron were comparing it to Jonah. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. And I think part of it is because of time. And <clears throat> I might have to go and get some water, but it could be because of time. And it could be because it's it, it sometimes it's a controversial subject and you could lose people. You could lose people. So the and this is uh, Michael Gronmeyer. How you doing, Michael? This solar eclipse is a harbinger, in my opinion. I agree. There's something going on with this. End times scare a lot of churches. The media won't talk about anything that's going on. And that's that's the problem as well, is we're kind of left in the dark. Kind of left in the dark. Let's see what else we've got going on here. He said my name... Thandril. Hopefully I said it right. Thanos? Thandril. August 21st eclipse was on a Monday, and the April 8th eclipse will also be on a Monday as well. Yeah, exactly one week after Easter. Isn't that interesting? Good evening, Andrew. Welcome. Let's see what else. Some people have rapture dreams. Yeah, I've heard that. We've we've heard about that also on this channel. People have been talking like in the comments about that. It's interesting. Pre on March 24th. <clears throat> There's a Nineveh. What? The pandemic has spread to Canada. Nineveh. We have a Nineveh in Nova Scotia. Probably shouldn't say that, right? On the YouTube channel. Pandemic. Uh, 2017 went through seven towns called Salem. Interesting. 8R2, Nissan are the same month this year. Okay. Civil War movies set to release April 7, April 12th. That is interesting. Huh. Joyce, and yes, you said right. Thrice, three times where? And once unaware. All right. Awesome, awesome. Okay. All right, so what we're going to do, I'll come back to the comments. Feel free to, if, if there's anything you guys want to talk about specifically, but I have a little bit of an agenda tonight. And I mentioned in a video, I showed a picture of a solar eclipse. And again, when you when you think about it from the perspective of the media, sometimes they always they they don't always tell you what's really going on. And obviously, we can watch movies where they hint at this kind of stuff. I want to talk a little bit about satellites tonight. I want to talk a little bit about satellites. I don't know where you guys are sitting, where your position is in regards to landing on the moon, uh, NASA, all that kind of stuff. I'm not. I don't want to get into a fist fight over that, but I personally have never believed that we landed on the moon. That's just me. And I could never really, <clears throat> I come from the broadcast background, <clears throat> and I could never, there are fireworks going on right now outside my house. What day is it today? It's the 24th. There's no reason for fireworks. Sounds like firecrackers. Um, thought maybe gunfire. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm trying to think. I, I, don't, I don't know any reason why they would have fireworks outside right now. We live in a small town in Cochrane. Pretty quiet. But. <clears throat> yeah, I just heard a bunch of fireworks going off, which is kind of interesting. I'm just listening. I think it stopped. I think it stopped. 
maybe somebody's birthday. But yeah, in regards, regards to NASA landing on the moon with all Neil Armstrong and all this and the technology behind it, man, you really have to have faith in that. Like, seriously, you have to have a ton of faith in NASA, one company, to be able to get to the moon. And again, like I said, I'm not trying to dive into conspiracies, but you have to kind of wrap your head around this stuff where I'm about to go. So, for example, when you think about, and I talked about this before, there's no delay when it comes to President Richard Nixon talking to Neil Armstrong, but virtually no delay. I get it. You could add amplifiers and all this kind of stuff, but we just didn't have the technology back then to be able to wirelessly broadcast a signal 240,000 kilometers away and bounce it back, back to us at the same exact moment. There was no delay. You can say they edited it and synced it up so that there was no delay. But that's not how they presented it. They presented it like we were kind of idiots when it came to this kind of stuff. So the reason why I bring this up is because some of you may or may not know where we get our video feeds from, where we get our communications with her phone and all this kind of stuff. So like I have a sister in Australia, Nadine. If I want to call her, I use my cell phone. Most people think this goes up to the satellite, gets beamed to another country, and then relayed tower to tower and all this kind of stuff. Same thing with her video shows, with her movies, YouTube, live streaming, all this stuff. Most people think that it goes up to the satellites and then beam from satellite to satellite, and then back down to North America. And this is just, for some reason, this is just what we believe. But the truth is, 99% of everything that we watch, everything that we listen to, is under the sea. It's in submarine cables. And I don't know if you've... If you know that, if you're aware of that, again, not half, not 60%, but 99% of all our communication ends up under the sea in submarine cables. I made a video a couple summers ago when I first started my channel saying that if a war was to break out, the country that has the most submarines is going to win the war. Why? Because you can cut the cables. If you cut the sea cables, there's no more communication. How do we know this? Well, this happened with the island of, I want to say Tonga. Last year, there was a bit of a tsunami. An earthquake happened just off the coast of the island. And a tsunami hit and nobody could reach the island for days, if for hours, if not days. They couldn't reach the island. Why? All c- cell phone communication was cut off because of the plates underneath the island had shifted and cut the cables. So they couldn't call. There was no news. There was no communication. The island was cut off from the world. The world was cut off from the island. That's a fact. So we're going to watch a little video. (laughs) I told you so. Yeah, that's probably my pronoun too, is I told you so. So we're going to watch a little video on how we get our communications and all this kind of stuff. Just a short video. I'm going to play it. And then we're going to watch it. And then we're going to talk about it. It's not very long. What is it? It's five minutes, six minutes long. So 
here we go. Going to watch this. Just grab it. All right. Ninety-nine percent of all internet traffic, from this video to your Pokemon Go account to your family WhatsApp group, runs on a hidden network of undersea cables. Why should you care? Because modern life is increasingly dependent on those slinky subaquatic wires, and they get attacked by sharks from time to time. How do they work? What's the future for them? Join us today as we plunge the depths and ask how the internet travels across oceans. According to the authoritative Submarine Cable Map website, there are currently 493 active or actively under construction subsea internet cables crisscrossing the globe. These range from the relatively modest 300-kilometer Azerbaijan to Turkmenistan wire running under the Black Sea to the absolutely gargantuan 6,600-kilometer Marea cable linking Virginia Beach in the U.S. with Bilbao in northern <coughs> Spain. Maria weighs the same as 24 blue whales, apparently. The firms laying down this serpentine superhighway, worldwide there's now 1.5 million kilometers of undersea data wires, are cagey about how much it all costs. But professional estimates indicate a typical transoceanic cable should set you back between three and four hundred millions of dollars, which seems like a lot because they're not especially thick, typically around the girth of a garden hose, and that includes layers of protective thixotropic jelly around the all-important fiber optic core, plus multiple plastic sheets and copper wiring to power the thing. But even so, on average, they can ferry an awesome 100 gigabytes per second in data, with newer and forthcoming cables able to transmit 400 gigabytes per second. So how does so much data fit down such slim channels? Part of the answer is an extremely sophisticated data wrangling technique known as dense wavelength division multiplexing. Put simply, dense wavelength division multiplexing lets data providers use more than one wavelength of light to convey information fiber optically. Instead, several wavelengths are employed simultaneously and stacked, creating astonishing data speeds. This happens at buzzing, data center-like landing sites at either end of the cable. Are the cables just straightforward long wires? Not quite. Every 70 to 100 kilometers or so along the seabed, cables are punctuated with so-called repeaters. These essentially serve as amplifiers, keeping the signal strength up to par over long distances. That's why the cables incorporate copper conductors, by the way, carrying up to 10,000 volts of DC to power the repeaters. How are the cables laid? They're first coiled into vast cylindrical drums on specialized cable-laying ships. As much as a year's planning and charting will go into plotting the perfect transoceanic route. Bad locations for undersea cables include anywhere volcanic or anywhere especially earthquake or mudslide prone or anywhere heavily trawled by fishermen. The cable is spooled out the back of the ship at a sedate pace of around 10 kilometers an hour. If the ship encounters bad weather, the captain can decide whether to break off the cord, tie it to a buoy, and retreat to calmer waters. When the storm passes, the ship returns to the buoy and picks up where it left off. Accidents and outages on the cables can and do occur. In 2012, Hurricane Sandy in the US knocked out several key transatlantic cables, disrupting networks for hours. In 2011, the Fukushima earthquake in Japan caused similar online cuts. The vast majority of such disruptions, however, are the result of human carelessness, typically trawler nets or wayward ship's anchors. Cables situated close to the shore are significantly more at risk from such disruption. As such, the nearer to land a cable is, the more likely it'll be carefully armor-plated. Many are even dug into the seabed in long, dedicated trenches, carved out using ship-drawn plows. Awesomely, sharks have been spotted nibbling on one of Google's subsea cables. Get your teeth into this 2014 clip. More sinister even than that, the US government has consistently warned of interference in the cables from hostile foreign powers like Russia or China. The US government should know all about that. Whistleblower Edward Snowden revealed in 2013 how the NSA had no qualms eavesdropping on fiber optic communications. The geopolitical implications of undersea cables are also fascinating. Last year, the Australian government intervened to prevent Chinese technology giant Huawei from installing a cable connecting Australia with the Solomon Islands. The fear is that China China could use the link to gain access to Australia's sensitive internal networks. So who actually owns these cables? That's an interesting question. It's an expensive business, so historically nations or quasi-national telecom providers have picked up the bill. The world's biggest owner of cables remains America's AT&T, with a stake in some 230,000 kilometers of undersea cable. The second biggest owner is China Telecom. Frequently, cables are owned by groups or consortia of up to 50 separate owners, including tech firms, local government agencies, and other businesses. And while this model helps spread the initial cost, it's less helpful when something goes wrong and nobody can agree who has to put on a wetsuit and do something about it. Increasingly, big tech is recognizing its scope for growth is limited by the undersea cable network. 
So over the past few years, the overwhelming majority of investment in undersea cable infrastructure has come from companies like Facebook, which currently owns nearly 100,000 kilometers of cables. Google owns roughly the same amount. Amazon has its own massive private network, hooking up the online giant's mighty AWS data centers through cables traversing the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, plus the Mediterranean and the Red Sea and the South China Sea. The tech giants like to frame these vast environmentally disruptive infrastructure projects as civilization-enhancing largesse on their part. But they're also <coughs> shareholder companies, remember, who know perfectly well that increasing the number of human beings online is the only way they can continue to grow. Hang on a second, you're probably thinking, what about Starlink? Isn't our old mate Elon about to make the internet wireless any day now? For now, cable is by far the cheapest and most efficient means of yeeting vast packets of data over incredibly long distances fast. Even normally bullish Musk says Starlink is only aimed at people who don't presently enjoy access to high-speed fiber. But who knows how that'll pan out in a decade or two. For now, the future is very much undersea cables. Only this summer, Google and Facebook announced a joint initiative to build an undersea cable named Apricot. Apricot will link up Singapore, Japan, Guam, the Philippines, Taiwan, and Indonesia by the year 2024. The longest subaquatic cable ever, a 45,000 kilometer billion dollar monster called Two Africa that will link up 33 nations, was just bankrolled by a Facebook-led consortium. What do you think? Will mankind's ingenious submarine network one day look as obsolete as the telegraph? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe for more Totally Wired tech content. All right. Enough of that. So, now that we've got a bit of a grasp of where our internet comes from, most of you might be asking now, well, what about Elon Musk with all his satellites? Like, I actually have his autobiography. He's got another book out. It's bogus. It's baloney. At the end of the day, they're snowing us on this kind of stuff. So if you go back to what I was talking about in regards to landing on the moon, if 99% of our cables is more efficient to run with lines, fiber optics, all this stuff underwater, from continent to continent, how on God's green earth do they communicate from here to the sun or to the moon wirelessly? If we can't do it on earth, how can you do it in space 240,000 kilometers away? That's a simple question that can never be answered. Simple question. Why is Google, why is Facebook, aka Meta, why is Microsoft, why is Huawei and all these other countries focusing on submarine cables? If you want to make money, invest in undersea cables. Invest in those companies because they're not going away. It's not going to be obsolete. We've been doing this since like the 1800s. The first communication was going across from Newfoundland to Europe, and that was an underwater sea cable. What we need is some military experts to verify or deny what I'm saying. Because this invention is fantastic for getting communication across. Think about submarines. When they go under, there's no more cell phone coverage. And again, I'm not a rocket surgeon. But when you begin to question this stuff and you start taking off your shoes and socks and you start thinking about this stuff... You start thinking, well, what else are they not telling us? So we have April 8th coming down the pipes. A solar eclipse. What about EMP strikes? How would we know if it wasn't an inside job? 
or if it was in another country. How do we know? How would we know? If my kids lose this cell phone or if they misplace it in a vehicle or it's in the bathroom and they're like, oh, my God, oh, my God, I don't know where my cell phone is. My life is over. Imagine millions of teenagers that can't get access to watching Taylor Swift at a football game, cameos. Imagine that going away overnight. We're going to have massive panic with kids out in the street asking their parents to turn back, turn on Netflix, put friends back in. Pandemonium. Why? Just something simple. And I'm being a little facetious here. But we get like this. If if I misplace my phone, I'm like, where's my fix? I, I don't know where my phone is. And I don't smoke, but I'm just I'm just saying it's kind of like that. Where where is it? We bring our phones to bed. At least I do. Put my phone on my nightstand, it's my alarm. And then in the morning, I pick up that, go to my kitchen table, and there's my Bible. I grab this before my Bible. This is the last thing I touch after my Bible. This is how we're conditioned. And someone might say, oh, wow, no, no, I, I handle the Bible all the, time, all the time. Really? Really, do you? I think we have this with us all the time. We go to the bathroom with this all the time. <clears throat> if I go to the movie theater with my kids, call them kids, anywhere from age 28 to 30, 31, my daughter, and I apologize if you're watching this, Talisa, but please leave your cell phone off. Don't text anybody in the theater, especially if you and I are going to see a movie together. Just turn the phone off. It's only for two hours. Unless you're watching Avatar, then it's three hours. But you can make it. You can make it without your cell phone for three hours. It's just interesting. So if we're talking about an electric, electromagnetic pulse, it could be triggered from, let's say, a terrorist organization. <clears throat> I think we're unprepared for that kind of stuff. Again, not to cause a panic in the market, but <clears throat> it just shows you how fragile we really are when it comes to technology. Like, I have a hard time navigating in a new city unless I have GPS, even if I've been there before. I'm so reliant, and there's studies out that tell you that if you focus on taking pictures, like let's just say something simple, like you go to the zoo and you take pictures of lions, zebras, and giraffes, oh my, <clears throat> you don't remember that you're at the zoo. Why? Because you're now your memory is now on that picture. And if somebody were to ask you to describe what it was like at that zoo, <clears throat> and you look at the pictures to recall your, your memory, to jog your memory, your memory is going to be that picture, that photograph. It's not going to be the experience of going to a zoo. <clears throat> so if you really want to experience the zoo or a safari, don't bring your phone with you. Soak it in. Breathe it in. Smell it. Taste it. If you go to a new restaurant, don't bring your cell phone and take pictures. Kind of like this here. Look at this here. Let's do this right now. Take a picture of us here. Hey. Don't do that in a restaurant. Why? Because you're you're going to lose some of those memories. Hopefully this makes sense to people. Yeah, I always wish I had 
those communicator phones like from Star Trek, Captain Kirk. Those were the best flip phones. I never wanted to move away from flip phones. But then everybody else was getting a Samsung, iPhones. So much peer pressure to go to an iPhone. It's crazy. So when it comes to April 8th, let's just say, for example, there is an EMP strike or a power, power outage. I don't think we'd be prepared. I really don't. I think we're too conditioned to be consumed with our electronics. Even with YouTube. I have a YouTube channel. I feel weird now if I don't make a video every day. It's just a habit. But I feel like something is missing. That's not good either. It's not good either. Obviously, you can talk about building momentum. My channel's growing and all this kind of stuff. But there's something to be said about that where you're you're actually, you're almost addicted now to something that you've created out of nothing. Because I remember at the beginning, <clears throat> I would go a week without making a video. And now I make sometimes two in a day. And part of it is I do like communicating with, with uh, my audience, for sure. But I think as a Christian, sometimes we have to really think about this stuff. You know, like maybe even tonight, <clears throat> I'll just leave my phone here and go to bed without it. Try that. I dare anybody to try that tonight and see how they feel. I bet you the first night you're not going to be able to sleep because your phone is in another room and you're going to be thinking, did I leave it on? Is it off? Will I have a charge tomorrow morning or will it be dead in the morning? And you'll toss and turn and toss and turn. And then you're like, oh, why did I listen to Shane? You go back out to the living room. You grab your phone. You bring it back to your bedroom. And you plug it back in. You charge it. And you look at it. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. There's something interesting on TikTok that I missed. I missed a whole bunch of stuff on TikTok. And you start scrolling. But now you got fed. Your flesh got fed. Your little itch got fed. And this is, this is something that I think that we're unaware of. So if there was a bit of a glitch, a power outage, maybe, was it, maybe it'll be like a cutback sometime in the future where they just cut the power in one region, one area. We're going to feel it, man. We're going to feel it. Yeah. Don't be bound to your phone, brother. It's a distraction to the word. 100%. I'm just telling you the truth. We're all addicted to our devices. We all are. Some of us don't realize it. I realize it. Some of us like it. Some of us don't. It's just kind of interesting. So when it comes to internet, being underground, like look at this stuff. Look at this here. This is crazy. So here's Canada. <clears throat> all that stuff on the ports, on the coasts, these are all internet cables. Look at this stuff. Right here, it's all going this way. All going along the Bering Sea. And then crisscrossing to the Hawaiian Islands and all that kind of stuff. Here, kind of a gaping hole, and, and really you cannot go, you cannot have internet access, if you will, below, I believe it's the 60th parallel, that it's actually illegal. Look how big the Antarctica is, just for a second. It's actually illegal to go below the 60th parallel without an escort. You cannot do it unannounced you cannot do it you can't go below i believe it's the 60th parallel it's crazy right so anyways the point is look at all these cables right here too going this way 
South America, all the way up to the United States, and then right here, Canada. So you got New York, you got Belport, all these areas going all the way across to Europe, going this way. These are all under, these are the submarine cables that I was telling you about. And then these ones go up to Greenland, to Iceland. They're all connecting. And this one here, look at this one. Goes all the way across and around. Like they actually lay it in the ocean floor this way instead of going across the land. Like you'd think it'd be better going that way. But instead, once they get it here, now you have cell towers that relay everything. Same thing over here. Look at where all the ports are. Ding, 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 ding. Look at that. Thailand. Just riddled with cables. Like, look at China. All here. India. Right here. Just massive. Right here. Like, man. And this is something they don't teach you in school. I was never taught that in school. Crazy, right? Crazy. All right, let's go to the comments here. Let's see here. The more dead to the world you are, brother, the less you recognize it, therefore making it hard to navigate. But Ruf Salem, brother, he will guide and lead you to safety. Trust, okay? Uh, not sure what that means, but okay. I was able to work remotely thanks to my piece of steak. HD 1000, boy, that thing was huge. <clears throat> uh, are you talking about a cell phone that you had, or what did you have? Easy for me. Don't be bound to your phone, for sure. And I'll say, man, I was able to read more than 10 chapters of the Bible yesterday. A lot of it was because I wasn't focused on my phone. That's another key right there is... Instead of reading your phone, reading the Bible app from your phone, I'm not totally against it, but if you're always going to your phone, chances are somebody's going to message you while you're on the phone. And then you're distracted. Whereas I just pick a spot, I'm at the kitchen table, and sometimes I'll even use headphones, listen to the Bible audio app, <clears throat> and on Amazon, it's free, by the way. You can download all 66 books individually. And I think there's some free ones as well, like the whole Bible. King James, anyway. But I download all 66 books because I like uh, listening to them on an individual basis as well while I'm driving. I just like doing that. Because I find that if I have 66 hours... Of content from one book sometimes it gets glitchy sometimes it doesn't open whatever I have an older phone it's not quite a Captain Kirk flip phone but if you can isolate yourself away from your phone and just focus on reading your Bible I think that's a good thing I really do it depends if you have what I have to reveal you have to keep press I'm currently broadcasting right now I have been for almost 15 hours straight. So you're broadcasting, but you're on here. Interesting. Multitasker. All right, Jane, I don't appreciate you often, as you know, but you're totally right about the cell phones. Yeah, thank you, shamelessly, Red. Appreciate it. I can and do leave mine on another room, sometimes at night, but I'm a slave to it. That's no lie. Yeah, so I know people don't always agree with what I have to say. But every once in a while, I hit a home run. Every once in a while. You know, and I'm I'm trying to get away from being facetious or, you know, knocking people down or whatever. It's, sometimes it's hard, right? Like you just come at people and you're like, you don't believe what I believe and whatever it is. But the further I get into God's word, I'm just like, man, everybody's on their journey to understand what Christ did for us. That's really our journey. Once you understand what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, a whole new world opens up. You start seeing things. 
and all of a sudden you come across things like underwater sea cables. Like uh, I only found this out like maybe two years ago. I'm 54 years old. I had no idea. And perhaps I've heard of it before, but I didn't know that there was a whole industry like Google, Meta, Amazon, Microsoft buying these huge ships, spending millions of dollars investing in underwater sea cables. I thought we were building satellites everywhere. I thought that's what we're doing. And I know you can see stuff in space when you look at night when there's no there's no lights, no light pollution. I know you can see objects up there. My question is what are they really doing? They're not access, they're not beaming my cell phone from one place to another because we have line of sight towers. Why do you think when you go to the mountains you lose your connection? It's because there's no towers until you get to a part where they actually start having cell towers and then you get your connection back. The higher up you go in the mountains, no, you'd think you'd get closer to the satellites. You should have better cell coverage. You stand at the top of the mountain with your cell phone. It's like, look at this. I have the best coverage. It's actually not true. You actually have to get closer to these cell towers. Just interesting, right? This is how I think. This is maybe this is why you guys like this channel is because I think outside the box. I'm not just stuck in a box. I look around. I see what's going on. And I don't watch the news. But I pay attention to how people are reacting, acting, all this kind of stuff. And there, there is something going on right now in the air. And I believe there's there's two things going on. And I, I talk with my sister Amy about this all the time. And I think she's the one that kind of got me on this thought process. That there is a little bit of a correcting going on within the body of Christ. As in, people are getting hungry for his word. And they want the truth. And so they're beginning to dive in. And even young people are starting to do this. They're starting to have a hunger for his word because they're looking around and they're just getting fatigued. They're getting tired. Friends gets old. I'm sorry. Friends gets old after a while. You can only rewatch the series so many times before you're like, hmm, I need something else. I'm missing something. Inside, I'm actually starving. And I don't know it. What are you starting from? Well, you don't have the living water in you, which is the word of God, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the word. We have the Holy Spirit teaching us all things and reminding us of everything that Jesus Christ said when he was here on earth. So we have that, but we don't capitalize on it. Because instead, we are glued to this, and we don't read this. This is how you hear from him. If you want to hear from the Holy Spirit, you have to be immersed in here. Deeply immersed. Otherwise, you're going to be snowed left, right, and center when it comes to news Everything else. You're just going to fall for everything. So I believe something is happening when it comes to this solar eclipse on April 8th. And I mentioned earlier, it's almost like two things are going on. One is a cleansing of the church. The other one is people are, it feels like are getting more blind. That's a hard thing to explain. But it's almost like, and I might make a video about this in regards to Romans, where Paul is talking about vessels destined for destruction. 
people are like, oh, that's, Paul's very Calvinistic. He's basically saying that there are people that are destined for hell, and there are people that are destined for heaven. And there's no choice anymore. And people walk around pointing at people going, yeah, I think that guy's going to hell. I don't think he was ever a Christian. I think that guy's a Christian. Seems like a pretty good guy. Meanwhile, we don't know their heart. We don't know the work that the Holy Spirit is doing. Unbeknownst to you and me, we are probably unaware that it's actually the Holy Spirit that actually saves people. That's not me. It's not what I say. It's not what I do. I can't save people. I can share the gospel. But if they're not willing to listen, really all I'm doing is just planting a seed for someone else to water and come along and share. And then a little bit more gets watered. It's almost like we're bamboo trees. I don't know if you know how bamboo trees grow. But you basically water a bamboo tree for five years before you see any leaves, anything grows. And then it, you can't stop it. It's kind of like us. Get a little bit of watering here, a little bit of watering here. Maybe you go, go to visit a church with your spouse. Your spouse is a Christian. You're not a Christian. And you're like, oh, okay. Because I want to go out the boys tonight, big football game happening, I'll go with you to church. Unbeknownst to them, the gospel gets planted, and they walk out of there and they're like, huh, there was one point that was kind of interesting that the pastor said. But I still don't believe. And then someone else comes across in their life. Maybe a relative gets saved. All of a sudden they're like, hmm, what that person said is kind of interesting. Just a little bit more water, a little bit water, and then all of a sudden somebody comes up and leads them to the Lord, and they're like, that was because of me. I led this person to the Lord. Forgetting that it was probably 30 people over the past 10 years that helped you. So when it comes to vessels destined for destruction, one of the things that I noticed, my observation in Romans is that the more mercy God shows you and the more time he gives you, the more of a chance you have your heart to get hardened because of his mercy. And we know this because something happens to us where we go to church, we have a good experience, a religious experience, if you will. We're really digging the worship, and we're just on fire. And then the next day, something happens where we fall, we mess up, and we're like, but I had such a good experience last night. How come I fell? And I know God is merciful. I know he has mercy. And then the next week, maybe you do it again, and you realize that he has mercy still on you, and inside you're like, man, I've fallen so many times. I feel like such a hypocrite. I can't go back to church now. So I fell like 20 times, 30 times, not realizing that God's mercy actually brings us to him. But for some people, because of that mercy that was shown to them, their hearts start to get a little bit hard because of the mercy. And they're like, I've messed up so much. I keep messing up. I keep doing this. Now my heart gets a little bit harder and a little bit harder. And it gets a little bit less pliable because God can't correct us now. Because of his mercy. And this is what I think Paul was on to. He was talking about this, that because there's so much mercy shown. And people get mad at this. When you talk about greasy grace. I think it is greasy grace. I think it's really slippery, greasy grace. Unlimited 
Greasy Grace. Slippery Grace. And some people don't like that. They would rather point fingers at people and condemn them and say, you messed up, so you're going to hell. You're going to the lake of fire where you belong. And you probably weren't a Christian, and you kicked them in the rear end on the way out. Not realizing that we have a little bit more slippery grace than we're aware of. What do I mean by that? It's unlimited. You can't out sin God's grace. You can't. Because that would nullify what happened on the cross. So eventually you're going to get to a point and you're going to be like, okay, so I messed up a whole bunch of times and you still love me? Yes. Still forgive me, right? Yes. Okay. So you're saying I can stop? Yeah, you can if you want to. That rubs people the wrong way, I'm telling you. Telling people that they can actually stop sinning. And I'm talking about the ones you know. You know. I'm not talking about the stuff that we do that we're unaware of. This flesh is out to get us, man. It's out to get us. And the second you say, I will never watch porn again. I will never look lustfully unto a woman. I will always read my Bible. I will always go to church. I will go to every Bible study this week, seven days a week. Start the clock because you just woke up your flesh. Now your flesh is is awake. This thing is out to get us. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So the only way to put it to sleep, put it into a coma, like I mentioned in some of my other videos, is to ignore it. Don't feed it. How do you feed it? You feed it by making stupid rules. I swear. I will never swear again. Oh, I just did it. That's what we do every day. So don't do that. Instead of just run into his arms. Run away from that imaginary line of no return. People always want to know, well, where's that line that I can camp out on where there's no forgiveness? It's like, do you even understand what you're talking about? Why would you want to live there? Why would you want to camp there? Go over here. So when we're talking about two things happening, a little bit more of a hardening of people's hearts because of God's mercy, and then on the other side of it, once you realize what Jesus Christ did for us, all of a sudden, man, your heart becomes pliable. Now you can get corrected. You can get your heart burnt, bent in a certain direction. It's like, man, I like going to church now. I like going to men's Bible studies. I never used to. I'm talking to me personally. I would avoid men's Bible studies. Now I lead the men's ministry in my church. We have like 200 men in our church. And I'm actually... Uh, helping organize an event, my first ever event. Uh, we're doing a men's retreat. We're staying overnight, and we're getting guest speakers on a Friday night. We're staying at a retreat center. And then the next morning, on, on a Saturday morning, I'm going to be doing a Bible study, like at 6 o'clock, something ridiculously early. And then we're having men's breakfast together. Then we're going to go play soccer and tug-of-war and I'm going to beat everybody at ping pong. I'm a little bit competitive when it comes to ping pong. I can play left-handed or right-handed. What do you call that? Ambidextrous. I can play both ways. Love ping pong. Love ping pong. So I will probably destroy most men at ping pong. We'll play ball hockey, soccer, tug of war. Get some adrenaline pumping. And then we'll have communion at the end in the evening for supper we'll have supper and then we'll have communion to wrap it up and then we'll come back home so that's fun but i wasn't that guy before i was like yeah leave me to my own devices i don't need to hang out with other men i don't need to fellowship i'll just be an island onto myself and that is dangerous 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 ground 
isolating yourself is dangerous. Chris, appreciate all the brothers and watchers. Give us the news. That's right. What's interesting is I wonder, and I've, I've mentioned this before, and I get it. I'm not bashing people that watch the news. I'm not. But imagine this. Imagine I have one copy of the New York Times newspaper. I have one copy of it. And I read it cover to cover. And then I buy another one, the same edition. I buy a hundred of them. Does that make me a hundred times smarter because I've read all the news? Does that make me a hundred times smarter? I would suggest that that makes you a hundred times dumber. Why? Because you spent so much time going over the same subject matter. And you just keep going over it again and again and again. And thinking that it makes you more wise when it doesn't. The news doesn't help you get smarter. This does. This gets you wiser. Like I said, I don't watch the news. Unless something pops up on YouTube when I'm watching maybe a Bible study. Someone's talking about something and then something pops up. But I'm not watching CNN, Fox, CBC, CTV in Canada, all these networks. I, I can't. I just, it's it's boring to me. The idea of having a news cycle for 15 minutes and then they tell you in 10 minutes this is going to happen. So you wait and then another 15 minutes goes by and it's the same news feed that you had at the top of the hour as it is at the bottom of the hour. Then you realize, uh-oh. I just wasted a half an hour. I could have got halfway through. I could have gone halfway through the book of Daniel. This morning, I went through the book of Daniel twice. And I listened to it twice yesterday, audio wise. And today I read it. it. Takes about an hour to get through the book of Daniel. And I'm trying to remember the book of Daniel. I'm trying to go through each chapter and trying to remember the points in it. I'd like to memorize the whole book. But there's some things that I'm uncovering, uncovering in the book of Daniel that I never saw before. And I've read it probably, I want to say about 16 to 20 times, 1-6 to 2 zero times in the past two years. Same thing with the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, all that stuff. In fact, the whole Bible I've read through a dozen times in the last two years. Romans, I can't tell you how many times. Probably 50, 60, 70 times I've read in the last two years. I hover around the Pauline epistles. I make sure I'm going through them each week. And then I'll dive into the Old Testament and just go through it systematically. But I always come back to the Pauline epistles. Why? If you're reading Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, good luck. Your spirit is going to get so heavy because of all the judgment that's coming upon Israel. Your spirit is going to be heavy. You're going to be like, oh, man, this looks like no hope. So you got to go back to the Pauline epistles. Get that hope back up. Yeah, you can go into the Gospels. You can go into Acts. I'm just telling you, this is what has happened to me. You stay too long in the Old Testament without going to the New. Like imagine going a whole year just in the Old Testament. It's tough. It's a tough battle. There's like, what is it, 3,500 3, names in the Old Testament? And there's like 1,000, 1,200 names in the New Testament altogether? So going through Chronicles, you get all these names, you get the Edomites, you get all the family tree and all this. That's hard to process. So you got to bounce into the New Testament once in a while. Let's see here. Any more comments? Hope you guys are getting something out of this. Something out of this. Gap does have scripturally back. Have debunked. Okay. 
Lots of stuff there. All right. That's amazing, Chris. Let's see here. Any good comments? Let's see here. Shameless about being a redhead. Just red. Okay. No, you're good. Just saying I'm trying so hard to expose what it is. I found all the school of prophets stuff is real. You can see our future scriptures. Let's see here. Bible code. Yeah, I've heard about that. Great channel. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, you know what? I think it's because of our community here that we're building up inside. You know? Like we're being honest, we're being real, we're wrestling through these scriptures together, we're wrestling through thoughts, what's going on around us. Codes, everything in the scriptures. I read scripture every day, but I do from my app. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that that's bad. I'm just saying sometimes it's almost like, you know, if you stand in the lineup sometimes, like at a Tim Hortons or something, you may not even notice that one of your friends is in the lineup because you're on your phone updating whatever it is, you're, all this. Sometimes you just miss out. That's all I'm saying. I Hey, I have the Bible app on here as well. I have all kinds of King James Bible, uh, James Earl Jones, uh, what's his name, Chris Saket. There's a few of them. A few of them. I just downloaded them all. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Awesome. Spirit, please teach me, guide me, give me wisdom and discernment. And that's a promise. Jesus said, when I go away, the comforter is going to come. And when you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on the cross, he rose again on the third day, and he's alive, you believe we are also sealed by the Holy Spirit, and his job is not to talk about himself, it's to talk about Jesus Christ and to teach us all things. That's a promise. That's what we can take to the bank. Look at where it says Jerusalem. Okay, I think... You're going off on a tangent there, Chris. Don't mind, but we're kind of staying here. I don't want sending people somewhere else kind of thing. Christians, lovers of the truth. I think it's time for very long fast from the phone. Yeah, and that's hard to do. I'm telling you, that's hard. I would almost think it's easier to fast three days without food than it is to go three days without your phone in this day and age. I really do. Facebook, yeah, I rarely go on to Facebook. Rarely. Like maybe once in a blue moon. And we had a blue moon a few weeks back. Dun, 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 dun. Twitter has been my biggest addiction. I was addicted to that app for 10 years. Wow. And I wasted. Wish I can get back. Finally decided to leave that app after I have deleted many. Yeah, it's interesting, right? You know what's interesting, too, is when you look at people's websites, usually at the bottom they'll have something like uh, Facebook, Twitter, X, sorry, Facebook, X, Instagram, YouTube, they have all those icons. So if you have Facebook, then you have X, then you have Instagram, then you have YouTube, it's almost like the acronym is Face Marked In You. Face Marked In You. Facebook, X, Instagram, you. Those are the four main social media. So it's almost like you're marking your face, your mind, and it's in you now. It's kind of weird, right? It's kind of a weird play on 
on the social media platforms that we just, we love. We're addicted to it. You know, we'll hear this from many people saying, man, I'm a... I'm addicted to social media. I'm addicted to YouTube. I'm addicted to TikTok. I just love TikTok. I could listen to TikTok all day long. We don't even realize what we're saying. Facebook is like Hotel California. You check in, but you can never check out. Had to delete the entire app to stop mindlessly opening on my phone. Yeah, and that's what we do. It's kind of interesting. And even you've probably heard about the phantom itch. When you, um, if you get your arm cut off, there's been clinical studies where people will actually have an itch on their finger at night when they're dreaming or whatever. And they wake up and they're like, man, my hand is on fire. And they realize that their hand has been, their arm has been cut off surgically. But they feel like it's still there. And I've had this where I'll have this in my pocket. And then my my phone will go off in my pocket. And I'm like, oh, man. And you reach down and you're like, oh, wait a minute. I actually don't have it. I thought I had, I thought my phone was vibrating in my front pocket. Then I realized I left my phone in the car, but it just, on that spot, it just went zzz, or in your back pocket, zzz, and you're like, you're always feeling, like, it's almost like, I think if we were observed by some alien entity, and I don't believe in aliens, just so you know, but if they were watching, they would look at us like we're weird because we're always fidgeting and we're like, what What are they doing all the time? What are these creatures doing all the time? Maybe let's just use the angels, for example, trying to figure us out. Why are they always like touching themselves and trying to, looks like they're looking for their car keys. All, uh, it's like, oh, 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 I thought I lost my phone. We do that all the time. Even in church, we go to sit down and, we we'll put down our phone, and it's like, where did I put my phone? Is it out in the lobby? The coffee? And the pastor is preaching a fantastic message, and we're going, I appreciate what you're sharing, Pastor, but I don't remember where I put my phone, so hold that thought. I'm going to get up and interrupt your message, and I'm going to walk to the back of the church, and I'm going to go find my phone, because that's more important than hearing about Jesus Christ. That's what we do. I'm telling you, we're crazy. Facts, I'm all or nothing person to my detriment. It's hard for me to just limit my time on social media. Well, yeah, it's designed that way. It's designed to make you open your phone, and we get conditioned to that. Same thing with eating potato chips. You eat one bag, or you have one chip, you have to eat the whole bag. At least I do. I'm also old like Shane. Who's old? I'm not that old. Am I? <laughs> and I don't think anyone in my generation anticipated these devices being so addicting. 100%. I remember as a kid going around like we never had cell phones till I got married. That's when I got a cell phone. Before that, pay phone. I have to go to a pay phone. No doubt, 27 had some of my childhood without tech, but most of my life has been around tech. Interesting, right? That's why I say, like, if there's an EMP strike, we are done. Like, mentally. Like, we're just like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I'll just stay at home in the dark and just wait till the lights come back on because I don't know where the candles are. And I'll just wait. That's what we do. Only grace and more grace. Amen. I know, and it sounds funny to say greasy grace. I used to not like that term. But it's kind of true in some ways. Like, not in a negative way, but just unlimited grace, man. Unlimited. Only through Jesus' blood, precious blood. Yeah, grace only. And it's nothing that we did. That's the trick. That's the mystery. We didn't do anything to deserve it. 
important to remember Jesus knew exactly what he's getting into when he called you. He sees the end before the beginning. Yep. Mentioned Bible studies. Thompson Chain, King James Reference Bible is incredible for Bible studies. Yep. I bought a friend, the Thompson King James Bible. Lydia, she might be watching this right now. I hope you're reading it. hope you're reading it. It's a good Bible. It's a good Bible. Hebrews 9.14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Amen. YouTubing with Marsha. Awesome. Thank you for that. That's awesome. I love it when people share scripture verses. I really do. I'm not sure it's dangerous ground considering the dangerous ground of false teaching out there. I prefer a small circle of friends to call church. I hear what you're throwing down. I hear it. I still think there's something important about attending a physical church because you're hanging around with the body of Christ. And sometimes someone says something just at the right time that resonates with you. And when you're listening to a message at the front of the church, I don't know. There's just something special about gathering. There's something special about having 20, 30 men on a Monday night taking two hours out of their time to do a Bible study. That's precious. Something about it. Something about hanging around other believers. Speaking of Bible studies, I got to find a new Bible study and a new local church in general. I was in one that really enjoyed, but it's just kind of dissipated due to life changes, sadly. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation, 100%. Water baptism, love it. Love water baptism. I, I just think, again, there's something... There's something pure about the idea of you get saved and you you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and then you're making a public declaration. That's that's really all it is. It's it's basically you're you're joining Jesus in the baptism of his death. It's 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 symbolism. So we are joining him in baptism, the baptism doesn't save you, but it's that symbolic attribute, if you will, of shedding your flesh and basically dying to yourself. That's that's the symbolism of, of being put into, you know, you do this, it's almost like you're asleep in a coffin and you go back and then you get up. And I'm telling you, it's... It's just a reminder of what he did for us. He washed us clean. He washed us white of snow. White with snow. White as snow. I think it's a beautiful thing, man. I just, I, I do. I think it's a beautiful thing. We do it at the Bow River sometimes in the summer. And we'll get like 10, 15, 20 people. And it's so cold. And they're just like this shivering in their wetsuits. Uh, but there's something. I remember what it was like when I got baptized. Like I got submerged and I, and I came out of the water. And I was just like, man, it's just so refreshing. It's just so refreshing. And when I came home, my sister was like, she was younger. She's like, what's up with you? Something's different about you. You look happy. And so, yeah, so that's my humble opinion. Does it save you? No. I have a friend that got baptized in the desert by a sprinkling with just a little bottle of water, a couple of drops, because they were out in the desert. Just a little bit of drops, you know. So that's that's my that's my humble opinion. It's just symbolic of what Christ did for us, and we're we are to basically die to our flesh. And we, are, and if we believe that we are in the same baptism of Jesus Christ, we also believe that we are risen from the dead as well. Hopefully that makes sense. Shameless. 
strip off all the apps off your phone as few as possible is best as for facebook it is a security nightmare i treat it like a promiscuous woman all right yeah strip off your phone all the apps and everything yeah i get it i get it filled with good apps mostly digital addiction is real yep to communicate with people these days, so much digital, I just want to give it up completely. I hear you. I hear you. What are your thoughts on the twin solar flares that happened? I, I think I heard something about that. Not sure. Not sure about the twin solar flares. You know, maybe that could be an excuse to launch like an EMP strike and say it's from the solar flares or maybe the solar flares can actually do something. I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of above my my pay grade when you talk about space. Let's see what else is here. What else is here? What and whom to hate? Yep. Do I even hear about them? We are not even 2020 and 25. Here I'm at 143. God bless you, Shay. Yeah, it's funny, eh? Yeah, it's 11.50 my time. I just felt like doing a live stream tonight. Hopefully, you'll still be able to go to church tomorrow morning. But I, I just think it's it's nice to reflect at the end of a Saturday night and go, man, what Jesus Christ did for us is so precious, so I'll take I'll take everything. I'll take the water baptism. I'll take the communion. The communion is something special because you're you're symbolizing eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Sounds weird, right? But at the same time, that's kind of what we're doing here. We're eating his flesh and drinking his blood. If I could eat this whole thing, I would. But then people get bent out of shape. They're like, oh, that's disgusting. You are a disgusting individual. That you would eat Jesus Christ's flesh and blood. It's like, yeah, but I need it. I need him all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I need him. I need to renew my mind every single day. I have nine cats I'll eat. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good diet for sure. I remember going hunting with my father-in-law. And we were out deep in the woods. And we ate all the food. And we still had like a full day's journey to get out of the woods. And I remember looking at my father-in-law. And I swear he turned into a chicken. And I was like, you know what? I think if if things got really tough around here, I think I would be okay, Pa. I think I'd be okay. And he's like, we got to get you home, son. We got to get out of this forest because <laughs> you're starting to look at me like I'm lamb chops or something. I'm like, yeah, I'm getting hungry. And you're looking a little pudgy right now. I'm getting real hungry. We joke about that to this day. He said, you're kind of eyeballing me a little different. We're out in the woods and it's like, I think this guy could actually eat me right now. I think he's that hungry. I was probably 18. And remember, when we were young, like I could sit down watching TV, watching Gilligan's Island or Six Million Dollar Man or whatever it is, and I could eat a whole box of cereal. Done. Next. It would be nothing to cook a dozen eggs. Done. So yeah, my father-in-law was a little bit nervous. Is this guy going to eat me or not? It's kind of weird, right? Anyways, hopefully you guys understand that I'm just kidding around. But yeah, nine cats, yeah, I don't mind. I have a dog. I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it with my dog. Mind you, he is a wiener dog. A little bit of bread, a little bit of mustard, a little bit of ketchup. Weird, right? Uh, oh, in the generation follows ours, we'll even be able to travel across country, though. Google, even across town, yeah. We, we I feel like in some ways we're getting dumber. Some ways we're getting dumber. Nobody can read a map. Nobody can fix vehicles. They're taking that away from us as well. <clears throat> Woman said she'd pray for me to stop horrifying thoughts, and they stop. Nice. That's cool. 
That's really good. Another way is to read your read your Bible, and that'll stop horrifying thoughts. I promise you. That'll do it. You can actually control your thoughts. <clears throat> Church has become an institution. People arrive, then they leave, then there's hardly any fellowship, and too many of home online for tithing, prayer requests. Mine is filled with big screens. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I, I hear you, sister. I feel you. I get it. Some of my closest friendships have come from us being at a retreat out of town, staying overnight. Like I have friends. We, we actually have a group of friends. <clears throat> There's five of us all together. Five men, five wives, five husbands, five wives. And we get together once a year <clears throat> and we go out for dinner, the five of us, the 10 of us. We've known each other for about, I want to say 20, 25 years. And we do this every year. We try to, try to do it each year. For sure we hang out, but we try to go out formally for dinner or do something together. Maybe it's a birthday party or whatever each year, January 1st, for example. <clears throat> but we do that, and that came out because I was going to church. And we would hang out, and we go camping and different things together. So that came out of uh, fellowship. And we have to understand that the body of Christ is more than a building. But there's something special about hanging around with more than one person, with more than just yourself. Like if you're a woman, I would encourage you to hang out with other women that love the Lord as much as you are more than you. They can rub shoulders with you. You can rub off on you. Same thing with men. <clears throat> I think it's a dangerous place if a man is an island unto himself. I think we can keep each other accountable. We can share things that we can't share with our wife, struggles. You know, like I, I struggle, like an example would be I struggle. Man, I just, I could work seven days a week. Tell that to your spouse. It doesn't go over very well. But another man can step in and say, are you an idiot? Go home. Don't work so much. You're going to burn yourself out. At the end of your life, the last thing you're going to be thinking about is how many hours you spent. And then maybe a guy will slap you. Wake up, man. You know, men do that to each other. We slap each other around a bit. It's like, man, I'm tempted by this woman. Lusting, whatever. It's like, man, grow up. Your wife is a hundred times better than that. Snap out of it. Slap you around a bit. That's why we need each other. Hopefully that makes sense. Don't even know how to write in cursive, so it isn't just tech change, but they don't teach cursive. I did not know that. They don't teach cursive anymore? Man, I learned cursive be because I had to do lines in school. Right out of the Oxford Dictionary, they give me a page, and then I'd have to write, I will not pull Sally's hair again. I will not pull Sally's hair again. And the only way for me to get really fast is to write cursive. I will not write, I will not tug at Sally's hair anymore. I will not tug at Sally's hair anymore. A thousand times and then I can go home. Person has sinful thoughts. Can they be saved or can they be doomed from the first thought? Well, how much time do you got there, JRB? Here's the thing. This is from my humble experience when it comes to sinful thoughts, okay? It's not a sin to have a thought enter your head, enter your mind. That's not a sin. It's, and, and we know this, right? We know this. This is basic. This is grade one stuff. This is, this is milk and cookie stuff. We all understand that. So I'm going to try and go a little bit deeper. We have random thoughts that pop into our head based on our day. If we never ate food, we get a little bit hangry. All of a sudden, a woman comes around the corner at the wrong time. We're a little hangry. Maybe we haven't slept with our spouse for like a week or two weeks or three weeks or whatever. It's late at night, whatever it is. And you get tempted with a thought 
a thought pops into your head because the flesh is all basically your, it's like your flesh comes alive after 10 o'clock when you should be in bed like right now um your flesh comes alive and then maybe you get a little thought in your head but that thought isn't what isn't the sin like you you'll get some weird thoughts that pop into your head you know it's it's like have you ever had this thought where you're you're just standing in a lineup at Tim Hortons and you look over at your brother and you're like, you know what? If I sucker this guy right now with a punch, he won't even see it coming. I can just punch him right now. He would never know it. These are some of the most random, stupid thoughts that you get and you just go, that's dumb. Give it to the Lord. Not saying that I think like that. I'm just saying, my brother actually told me that once. He said, you ever think about that? <laughs> Made me laugh. He might even be watching this. Dustin, if you're watching this, that was actually funny saying that. But it's it's kind of like the thought comes in, and because you've read the word so much, you can decide now what you want to do with it. And what happens is some people go, you know what? I'm going to hang on to that thought a little bit more because it's actually feeding my flesh. And then you start meditating on it. Instead, what you should do is when the thought comes in, because it's not you doing it, it's your flesh. So your flesh has this thought, pops into your head, go do this, go do that, don't do this, whatever it is. Don't go to church, whatever. You look at it and you go, yeah, that's not of the Lord. <clears throat> you give it to him. Has nothing to do with Christianity. As in, whether or not you're saved. In fact, it might prove that you're saved. Because if you hate that thing, that tells you you're a Christian. And how do you prove it? Well, you can just go, Lord, I love you. You are my master. You are my savior. I love you. And I don't want to do anything to separate us at all even though you can't do it you can't separate but i'm just saying like i don't want to do i don't want to mess up so now that you say that you're like okay that's your that's what you want you want to be able to be like lord i just i love you so much i don't want to mess up your flesh is like i want you to mess up i want you to feel guilty i want you to feel horrible so that you don't go to church, so that you don't read your Bible. The flesh will not, cannot submit to God's authority. It will not do it. Your flesh won't do it. That's not its DNA. That's not its design. It's after the image of Adam. So what do I mean by that, that, that it does not submit? To God's authority, his will, his commandments, it will not do that. It won't do it. You have to put it to bed. You have to kill it. How do you kill it? You ignore it. Let it starve. It's always going to be around to the day we die. It will not submit to God's commandments. It won't. Once you understand that, now it's not you. That's your flesh. You're over here. You're like thinking about spiritual stuff. You're like, man, if I could read his word 24 hours a day, I would. But then your flesh is like, no, you don't need to. You don't need to read it at all. You're safe. You don't need it. You don't need to go to church. Isolate. Be by yourself. That's your flesh kicking into high gear. Just ignore it has nothing to you about being saved or not saved, being doomed, not doomed. It's your flesh that kicks into high gear the second you have rules and regulations. Try this, for example. Try and use your willpower. Don't think of a pink elephant. That's your flesh kicking in. It will not submit to you. It won't. Are you still thinking about a pink elephant? Well, stop it. Stop thinking about a pink elephant. 
stop it. Even if someone had a gun to your head, you wouldn't be able to do it. If they were going to burn you, you wouldn't be able to do it. Because your flesh, that's what it does. Why? Because you set a rule and you said, don't think about a pink elephant. And then now you're thinking about it. So instead of making all these silly rules, like I promise I will read my Bible every day for the rest of my life, just say, Lord, I want to get to know you just a little bit better today than I did yesterday. Please keep me close to you. Don't let me fall. Help me edify someone else. And when you do those kinds of things, you're not giving your flesh a chance to wake up. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that answers your question. Got a bailout. Feel like tank over here. Trying out, run. Eyes are shot. If you know any folks, test, debate, info, send them over. All right. Uh, what else? I'm going to go. Some people are taking off here. Gone online for tithing. Typo. Maybe these are my excuse for not going. I get it. I understand. I love Jesus. I do not like what church has become. We have to understand that the church, not the physical building, but the church is his body. We are his body. We are his flesh. We are one with him. So if you if you don't love the body, you don't love Jesus Christ. You can't separate the two. If you don't love the body, you don't love the Father. If you don't love the Father, you don't love the Son. If you don't love the Son, you don't love the Father. You can't separate that. So that's why I implore you to love on others. And how do you do that? Well, you build yourself up by reading the Bible. You read it and read it, read it, so that when you show up on Sunday, you're full. Your tank is full. So when you show up and somebody says something that maybe normally would be annoying to you or whatever, you're like, yeah, that's that's cool. Thank you for saying that or sharing whatever it is. And you just edify, you edify, you edify, you build them up, you put other people above you. I felt lighter after my baptism. It was incredible. Yes, it doesn't save us, but it's amazing nonetheless. I agree. Who is beyond redemption? It's a good question. It's a good question. I don't know. Paul looked like he was beyond redemption. Really, when you think about it, that was quite the turnaround. That's like an example that it's, you're never too far. Good night, Christopher. Sleep well. Say your prayers. All right. Yeah, I'm going to wind her down myself, guys. I uh, hope you guys got something out of it. Yeah, awesome. Everybody can say good night to everybody now. <laughs> We've got a nice little community here. I must say, guys, I like this. Uh, okay, wait, what? Every night I pray to take get taken out of here, shameless. My twin girls are waiting for me, born and buried on their birthday. Oh, that's so sad. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, and I get it. Like, Paul struggled with that, right? Like, he's like, man, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I'm caught between two places, betwixt, he said. I know to be here is better for you. And I would say the same thing for you, Chris, that it's, it's better for us that you're here from a selfish perspective. We're selfish here. It's better that you're with us because we can hear from you. You can edify the body and we appreciate you as a human being. And we're, we're selfish that way. We, we want you to be here. We need you here as a human, human soul to human soul. And when you're in heaven, you're not good to us on earth. And I understand, like many people are like, man, I'm so, this is not you. But other people say, man, I'm so sick and disgusted with my neighbors. They're so evil and wicked. I wish either God would smite them or take me out of here because I'm sick. I'm sick of this place. I'm sick of this world. I got so many aches and pains and whatever it is. I just think that's a weird spirit. I really do. It's like James and John saying, Lord, because the Samaritans were like, because you are looking towards Jerusalem, you want to go there. We want you to stay here. We want you to be our king. 
And Jesus knew what was in their hearts, that they were ready to make him king. So he was focused like a flint to Jerusalem. And then they're like, okay, get out of here then. Go. If you want to go to Jerusalem, go. And James and John said, um, question. Should we call fire down and kill them right here? Should we just pancake them with hailstones and just burn them to a crisp? What do you think, Lord? And Jesus is like, you know what, guys? Honestly, you don't even know what spirit you are of for saying that. Just interesting, right? What's even more interesting is there was probably a possibility that they could have done it with their authority, just like we probably have authority that we're unaware of. So, yeah, I get it. Some people are tired. They're like, oh, man, one more day. Yeah, like one more day to get to know him, one more day to get to memorize his Bible. Like, I look forward to every morning, man. If Jesus doesn't come for another 30 years, I still got the Holy Spirit. I talk to the Holy Spirit. I get to know him. I'm okay if he comes 30 years from now, honestly. I'll be 84, but I'm okay. I get to see my grandkid. What was that, 20 years? He'd be like 20. And I love people. And the more I know his word, the more I love people. And the more I'm okay either way. If he comes... While we're on this live stream, I'm okay. Let's go. If he doesn't and he tarries, I'm okay. Because there's work to be done. What is that work? It's our vocation. What is our vocation? It's to edify the church. That's the good works that he's planned. What is that? Putting everybody else above you. Before you. Edifying everyone to the full stature of Christ. That is our work. That is our job. That is our occupation. That is our vocation. I'm surprised you guys are still on here. It's like late. Wow. Luke 21, 25. There shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity and the sea... And the waves roaring. Yep, tsunamis. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Yeah, that's good. Good, good, good. Holy here, serving to serve is not a blessing. It's a burden. If you're 100% in, I have a job to do and I'm burnt out on chasing teachers to show what I got. Yeah, why do you need to, te to chase teachers down? To show what you got. So what? Why do you need to chase them down? Just find an audience. And people come to your site. You don't need to go and correct teachers. And all that stuff. If that's what you're thinking. Hey I have something to show them. To help them. Just build your own YouTube channel. Build your community. And teach. You know. If it's of the Lord. Hopefully that makes sense. Don't be sorry. They did not have to deal with this place. Out of pass jail, $1,500 to boot. Okay. Then it's maybe to reevaluate re if the Zoli. Yeah, like it's um, the way I kind of look at it. Yeah, I know. Typos way I look at it is it's just reasonable to serve him. It's not anything special. It's because of what he did. So it's just reasonable for me to read my Bible. It's reasonable for me to go to church. It's reasonably reasonable for me to love on my wife, on my children, on my neighbor, on my dog, and not kick my dog. It's just, it's a reasonable service to do. It's just what we do as Christians. We edify each other. It's not a burden. We have to be careful on that, saying that. Because there were prophets 
so-called prophets approaching Jeremiah and they would go, they would say something like this. They go to Jeremiah and they'd be like, okay. <sighs> What's the burden of the Lord today? What's he going to tell us? And God was like, don't say that. Don't say that again. And they would do that day after day to Jeremiah. They'd say, tell us what the burden of the Lord is today because it's no good. The Lord is telling us is no good. It's evil. He's telling us to go to Babylon. You're telling us to pack our bags and go to Babylon and have children in Babylon. And you're telling us when we want to go to Egypt for protection and make a covenant with death, you're telling us that God is going to come into Egypt and destroy everyone there. And you're telling us not to stay here or we're going to get destroyed here. That's a burden. So go ahead, tell us what your burden is today, Jeremiah. And God's like, don't do that. That's one word that you cannot say. And I'm not just talking about you, Christopher. I'm just saying that this is something that jumps out to me, that Israel was getting into trouble because they were saying that God was basically a burden to them. And they would call him names, like they would say things like to God, they would say, you're not equal because you didn't destroy this nation. This was an evil nation, could be Persia, could have been Babylon, whatever. It's like, you are not fair. You're an unfair, unjust God. And God's like, I'm not fair. You're not fair. You're not equal. Because they're like, you're not equal. You're treating them. You should be destroying that nation, but you're not. And they're wicked and you're you're keeping them around and they're coming after us you're you're not equal and god's like i'm not equal you're not equal in fact i'm going to show you you're not equal because what i'm going to do now since you think i'm not equal i'm going to remove my hedge around you i was protecting you but now i'm not going to protect you because you want me to treat you like all the other nations that's what you said so that's what you get now you're going to be like all the other nations. You're going to get treated the same way. They're going to come in and invade. And they're going to take your wives, your women. And they're going to kill people right in front of you. Why? Because you said I'm not equal. And now I'm making you equal to these other nations. Until you change your mind. Watch a Bible study, teacher try proving that we are saved and judged by our works, by using revelation, judged by our works. I kind of, I, like I understand a little bit about what they're saying, but it's not the salvation issue then. This is like, this is like milk and cookie stuff, like really at the end of the day. The, like we're saved, but yet we have good works to do. And people are like, oh, there is no works. Okay, we'll be lazy then. There's things that we can be doing today as in edifying the church. Like that's, there's no other, there's no greater calling than to build up his church, build up his body, you know? And so from that perspective, yeah, there's probably going to be the Bema judgment, if you will, not the great white throne judgment, because we'll be judging, but the Bema seat, for example, where it'll be like, I just feel like the Lord won't even have to say anything. He'll just look us in the eye and you'll be like, man, I basically just washed away all the potential that I had. I was too complainy. I didn't like people as much as I probably should have. And now I'm facing the Lord and he's probably going to say something like, I had so much for you, but you didn't even ask me. You didn't care. You're still saved. You still enter in, but... I had bigger plans for you and you just, you didn't do them. I think that's kind of the, the thinking. It's not that you got saved or not saved. It's just, you know, and there is like, there is a great white throne judgment where the books were open, but those are people that didn't know God rejected him and everything. Because just before that was Armageddon. Everyone got wiped out there at the battle of Armageddon. So now you have the great white throne judgment and then the dead get called up. The sea gives up its dead. The earth gives up its death. Death 
and Hades give up their dead. So how do we know it's not us because we're already in heaven with our new bodies? So these, this category of people, the books are open, and another book is open, which is the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. Whoever's name is not found in there is tossed in the lake of fire. So whose names weren't found? All of them. That's the second resurrection. Blessed are they that take part in the first resurrection because they don't have to take part in the second resurrection, which is the second death. They get judged and they get sentenced to the lake of fire forever. Hopefully that makes sense. Yep. All right. I promise you. Yep. I'm a prophet. Called the pan you called the pandemic and the war. The pandemic required a Passover. Okay. You're a prophet. Okay. You're a compassionate, understanding man. You're helping a lot of people. Thank you for listening. Yeah, I try because it's it's my biggest battle is trying not to offend people with my freedom in Christ, if that makes sense. Because I'm telling you, I'm totally free because of what Christ did. I don't care about the little things anymore. I don't ask. My asks, if you will, in regards to the Lord are minimal. Why? Because I know what he has in store for me. Like, I quit my job after eight years. Resigned, if you will. After eight years of service. March 1st, one week. I don't have a backup plan. But I felt the direction that I was going with with the company was not what I wanted to do anymore. After eight years, I just felt, no. A little bit less pay, more work, same job. I'm like, yeah, it feels like I'm going backwards and my worth is a little bit more. So I said, no, thank you. I respectfully declined the offer for full benefits, everything, but less pay than what I was making for eight years. So I'm like, no, thanks. No, thank you. Talked with my wife and she's like, yeah, you made the right decision. I back you up 100%. So March 1st, no income coming in for myself. But I know my God is faithful. I know that without a doubt. I know it. I know it in my heart. I know something big is coming. I know something is planned from before the foundation of the earth. I just can't see it, but I know it's there. And I believe, I believe in his goodness. I believe in his character. And once you understand the character of God, you don't get batted around by the world. You don't. So that's where I'm in right now. And I love the Lord and I'm pressing in, I'm seeking him. And I'm like, Lord, I need wisdom every step of the way. I have mortgages. I have a mortgage to pay. We have car payments, food, groceries, all this kind of stuff. My wife works as well. But there's just two of us. It's not the end of the world. Tighten the ship a little bit. Cancel Netflix, these little things. God has a plan. And I'm just trying to remain faithful to him because on the other side of it, I want to be that guy that's like, man, I never doubted you for a second. And I honestly felt the Holy Spirit say to me, because I've been investing so much time in his word over the past two years, I felt the Holy Spirit just say, you know what? Let me do, let me do my work. I got something for you. Let me do this. I got this. I got your back. That's what I felt the Holy Spirit say to me. Like, cool. Cool. I'd like to know what it is, but hey, what's that saying? God is 
rarely early, but he's always on time. Rarely early, but he's always on time. And that's what I believe. 100%. I believe that. Let's see here. Could and should are different. No, I'm called. Risen from the dead already. Joel, I prayed for other than deathbed and they were cured. Of it. That's awesome. That is like, that's awesome. I'm telling you, that is awesome. Center prophet, yay. Miserable Job just saying. Okay. Can't forget God does design our bodies to, to be able to top procreate. To procreate. Yes. I think I know what you're saying. All right. As a man or woman, you have biological impulse. Yep. Just because we have bi doesn't mean we should act. Yeah, 100%. That's awesome. Hey, welcome, bond servant, as well. He says, when mind costly is testing my flesh, my flesh behaves better in my mind sometimes. Yep. Hey, there's my bro. Everyone say hi to my brother, Dustin. He's watching us. Extra player. How you doing, bro? It's my brother from the same mother. <laughs> I was going to say brother from another mother, but we have the same ma, the same dad. And somebody's up late. <laughs> spirit and flesh war against each other continually. If you're not experiencing the war, that time is question your faith. That's... Yeah, yeah, it's always there, always a battle. Yeah, let's see what else we got. Thank you, Shane, for your time. Needed this. It's been a difficult day, topped by difficult weeks. I couldn't imagine I actually would say that to you. But truly, thank you. Yeah, no, I know. We've had our disagreements. But, uh, yeah, no, I appreciate everyone that's taken time to come out here. And to just, you know, sometimes we wrestle through stuff. We wrestle through our faith. Really, at the end of the day, we're like, ah, oh, what does this verse mean? What does this mean? I know this means this. You're wrong. I'm right. This is what we do. It's actually quite funny when you think about it. At a moment of disagreement slightly, the church isn't the building. 100%. Yeah, it's not the building. It's the believers. Yeah, and I, I think I mentioned that, that. It's not the building where we're, we're his flesh, we're his bone, but there's something about going into a building where there's a whole bunch of believers. There's something about, like our church, we have 400, 500, 600 people worshiping. Like when you walk in and everybody's praising God, man, I'm telling you, there's something there that's powerful. Something powerful about that. And I just get visions of heaven where Christians are around the throne just worshiping God 24 hours a day. Like, that's what we do. We worship him all the time. Sweet dreams. All right. Good night, Carol. Good night. God bless you. Everybody signing off. I'm going to sign off right away, too. And I've agreed with 99. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's funny. It's a miracle. I'm on your video. Percent of everything. Awesome. See, I'm not really a bad guy. At the end of the day, I'm not really a bad guy. I'm just, I'm misunderstood. <laughs> uh, he said, pretty awesome. Uh, what was this? Battling stage four cancer isn't easy for me, and I know whether I live or die, I'll be with him. Yeah, for sure. We'll be praying for you too. Yeah, that's, wow. Said pretty awesome. Look forward to seeing you again during more time for sure. Thanks for being with us together tonight. You're, you have a gentleness and patience, fruits of the spirit. Thank you. Sleep well. Blessings. Awesome. Good night. Holy Father, I lift my brothers and sisters here in this time with Shane to you in prayer for them. Please touch them with your healing hands. Refresh us all. Thank you for your servant, Shane. For bringing your love and wisdom and care tonight and love for you and for us. Thank you. That was awesome. Man, thank you for that. 
See you live. Hey, Pam. Awesome. Yeah. We're, we're going long tonight. What are we? Uh, we're almost at two hours. I think that's almost a record. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go to bed too. I'm pretty tired. Ephesians 2.10, for we love, we are God's handiwork, creating Christ to do good works. There it is. That's the verse I was thinking about. Didn't know where it was, but thank you. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's right. Good night. Try to get better at all the typos. It's too late for me to type anymore. God bless everyone. God bless you. Have a good night. Red. I think I can call you Red. Chris, Brother Red. Yeah. Oh, Mary, you're still here. You're. I think you're the first person on, and you're still here. Depression is a spiritual war I go through. So we just pray for Mary Smith. We get it. We go through valleys and everything. I just pray that that spirit of depression will actually leave you even right now, even tonight, that you will know that without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ loves you, died for you, has a plan for you. And I'm telling you, if you had a snapshot of what he has planned for us in the future as well, not only today, but a thousand years from now, a hundred thousand years from now, a million years from now, like powerful, powerful. So I just pray, yeah, I pray that that uh, spirit of depression will lift from you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Awesome, awesome. Okay, good night, everyone. I'm going to bed. Have a good one. See you some other time. Yes, call me Red, and I'm your sister in Christ. We'll be better friends now. I know you're not a bad guy. <laughs> awesome. Okay, peace. Peace, everyone. Have a fantastic night. God bless.